You ever heard the saying, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing? <laughs> yeah, really good. It's profound and simple. A uh, couple problems. One is keeping the main thing the main thing. The other is knowing what the main thing is. Sometimes that's the issue. We're going to be in Acts chapter 6 today. And the context for this is always important to have the context, uh, to know uh, what has led to this, what it might be arising out of. And the context for Acts 6 is Acts 5. Uh, funny how it works that way. Acts chapter 5, and you can really summarize it in the verses 12 through 16, where it says more and more people were added to the church. More and more people became Christians. And why is that? Why did that happen? Well, the Jewish leaders do. In Acts 5.28, they said to the apostles, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. They knew why it was happening, why so many people were becoming Christians. Uh, so they arrested the apostles, they beat them, they threatened them uh, with death even. Uh, but it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, Every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ that the Christ is Jesus. So you have this external pressure from the Jewish leaders. This is the second time that Peter and John were arrested the first time, and it says all the apostles were arrested. Uh, you have this external pressure, and it's not working. Not doing anything at all. The, the leaders are saying, don't preach. And you remember what uh, Paul or Peter and John said the first time. The first time they preached this question. You know, shall we obey God rather than man? And then the second time they brought before it, it said, we have to obey God, not man. Oh, so Satan switches his tactics. And he's definitely behind all of this, and he will switch his tactics on us. If something's not working, he will try something else. And so the external pressure didn't work. He comes up with some potential internal pressure uh, to keep them from being as effective at preaching the word and thus leading more and more people to become Christians. So Acts chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Uh, it says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So what was happening here, and it's definitely continuing, you know, all the Christians at this point are of Jewish origin. They were Jews, became Christians, believed Christ was the Messiah. <laughs> Uh, and the, the Old Testament, the Jews, they had always uh, placed an emphasis on helping widows and orphans, people who really couldn't help themselves, uh, given the culture of that day. Uh, you know, to, to support yourself was largely a very physical endeavor, and it, it just wouldn't be able to be done, uh, especially if the, the widows were older. And so they had a daily distribution of food uh, for them. And uh, it says that uh, the... Hellenist widows complained that they were being overlooked in favor of the Hebrew widows. Well, what's that talking about? Uh, Hellenist is a term for uh, basically Greek culture. Uh, and I looked it up, like, why is that? And it said the Greek word for Greek is Hellene. I thought the Greek word for Greek would be Greek, but I don't know that. So that's where it comes from. If you hear of Hellenist, Hellenism, it's Greek-influenced culture. And if you've ever heard the adage, Rome conquered Greece militarily, but Greece conquered Rome culturally. Uh, they took over. Rome basically adopted the Greek culture. And so as Rome spread their influence throughout the world, well, Greek influence spread. And so most of the world was Hellenist in that sense, influenced by Greek culture, definitely in uh, not the Far East, but what we're used to seeing. Uh, and then the Hebrews would be those who were right there in Jerusalem. And remember, this is still following up from the Passover when people came from all over. And many of these Christians, you know, they would have they would have just stayed. And so you had these people who were there and the widows there, even less chance of being able to make a living. You had some that were from outside of Jerusalem. Those would be the Hellenist Jews and widows and some that were then from inside Jerusalem to Judea in that area. And those would be the Hebrews. Well, the Hellenist widows, the Greek culture widow says we aren't getting uh, our fair share in the daily distribution. Verse 2 and the 12, the apostles summoned the full number of the disciples so all the people who had become Christian at this point and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. 
Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. We should stop for a moment right there. How many times has anything pleased an entire gathering of Christians? Uh, especially here in the thousands. Uh, that right there is pretty amazing. Uh, but this one makes sense, doesn't it? And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and then the Holy Spirit. We'll see more about him later. Philip, likewise. Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Now, all those names are Hellenist names. They're names of Greek influence versus names of, you know, the Hebrew influence, names from the Old Testament. And that makes sense. You have that group complaining, and so you don't want to, you know, give any indication or any opportunity for someone to say, well, you brought in guys who were favoring their own anyway. And so these were Greek uh, Hellenist Jews who were in charge of this. Uh, these they set before the apostles, and the apostles then prayed and laid their hands on them. Oh, wow, that was close, wasn't it? That was close. You see what almost happened there? Look at verse 2 again, where they say, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Why did they say that? Not just why did they say that, but why did they say that? Not that it wasn't right, but why did they say it? Why did it come up? Because it would take too much time. It would, but why did they say that? Because it was a serious problem. Because it was a serious problem, but why did they say that? Do you just say stuff without any reason? You usually respond to something, don't you? If they said it's not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables, what do you think someone had suggested? Yeah, that you guys do that. Hey, you're in charge. You need to do this. You need to oversee directly this ministry. Yeah. They didn't say it for no reason. All the reasons that you gave are right. Again, we're going to look at why they shouldn't have done it, but why they say it. Because someone had suggested, yeah, this would be a good thing for you to do. They could have went that way. You know, we look at it now, but it could have went that way. This is a very subtle and easy to miss danger. This isn't like the leaders saying, stop preaching. And the apostles right away knew, like, no, God said do it. You say don't. We have to obey God. That was clear cut. This one here, though, uh, it's pretty subtle. Like, oh, yeah, they do need taken care of. And this is undermining our unity. I, I can see the need for this. Yeah, that was a subtle danger. The early church, though, gave priority to the word. Uh, that's what the title of the sermon is today. That's what our focus is. The, the church, God's church needs to give priority to the Word. Now, at this point, you realize there's no New Testament. That hasn't been written yet. Uh, they did have the Old Testament. They had divine insight into the Old Testament because the Jews have had the Old Testament for a long time, but they missed a lot of things. Uh, and so they had divine insight both from Jesus as he had taught them what the Old Testament scriptures meant. Uh, and I believe it even continued later uh, from God through his Spirit. Uh, direct re revelation as they needed it. So that's what the word would be for them. Uh, focused on God. Focused on Jesus. Well, uh, why should the early church give priority to the word? Why should our church? Why should the church give priority? Well, you think about it. The word is how we're saved. Uh, it's not the direct cause. It isn't the writing of the Bible that saved us. But it is the, what would be called the, the ultimate cause, and even the immediate. It's not the ultimate, it's the direct cause. It's the immediate. Because we don't hear about what saved us apart from the Word. Uh, it's how we're forgiven. Romans 10, 14 says, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So it's Jesus who saves. His death on the cross saves us. But how are people going to hear about that? Well, it comes through the Word, through people teaching, sharing, preaching the Word. It's how we're forgiven. Uh, it's how we're transformed. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Well, how does our mind get renewed? By the Word. By the Word. As we look in there and we see what God says, we see what Jesus was like. We're going to talk about that more later. We, we see who he was, what he was like, and we seek to live like that. That transforms us. 
And it's through the word that we're guided. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How do I know what to do in this crazy world? I look at the word. And that tells me what I should be doing, the direction I should be going. So the word is vitally important. The early church was faced with two pressures against the, the word. Again, the external pressure with the Jewish leaders saying, quit teaching this word. Quit teaching the, the, this message that you have. And then this internal pressure where, like, boy, we've got a big need here. Something has to be done. I, I believe most church leaders, at least the ones I know, because I know some pretty wild guys, uh, would endure persecution without much trouble. I mean, if they were faced with persecution, they would accept persecution for the sake of God. Um, and a lot of members would fall in that same category. I, you know, have things switched? Am I in an isolated group? Maybe. But what about distraction? They face persecution and do real well against it. But what about when we face distraction? You know, one thing to remember, and it's like with Ananias and Sapphira, this is early on in the church. This is going to set the direction that they go. What the apostles do here is going to set precedent for everything that follows. Well, has the church today followed that direction? Or have we missed this subtle threat of keeping the word first and foremost and central? Again, it is easy to miss this threat. This was a genuine need. You know, there's three needs, right? The absolute essential needs. Food, clothing, and shelter? This is food. These women had no way to provide for food. They would die without food. This is a genuine need. And you look at the fact that it was one group, the Hellenists, uh, and as opposed to the other group, the Hebrews, this could have undermined the unity of the church right away, right at the beginning. What did Jesus pray? What is the true Lord's Prayer? It's not our Father in heaven. That's the model prayer. What was Jesus' prayer for? Unity. Unity. Exactly. This is essential. This is a need. And it's a good thing. You know, taking care of widows. This wasn't like, you know, well, hey, we think, you know, the apostles potentially, like, you know, we need to just go off on a worldwide vacation or something. And, like, no one's going to argue. Feeding widows is a good thing. All right? That's another thing. All Christians could agree on. Feeding the widows who can't help themselves is a good thing. So you see that there. Uh, and one thing to realize, the apostles did make sure this need was taken care of. It's not like they said, this isn't as important as us preaching the word, so we're just going to totally ignore it. No. It says in verse 3, Therefore they spoke to the rest of the disciples, Brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. You know, they made sure that this definite need got met. But is there any doubt about their priority? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. We cannot give up this ministry of the word to wait tables. Well, what's it mean then? What's it look like today? Is what we always want to see. If we read this book of Acts, things that happened 2,000 years ago, our question needs to be, all right, how do we apply this today? What's it look like? And I think it, it exists on two levels. The main one is the church-wide level, but I think we can make some application to a personal level in our interaction with the word. On the church level, I think even there, there's two distinctions. There's the church as a whole. How does the church as a whole give priority to the word? And then how do church leaders uh, especially do that? So the church as a whole. Uh, I mentioned that saying. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, what is versus should be the main thing of churches today in the United States? Spreading the word. What is the main thing that is versus should be? So you, would you contend that that is or what should be? Yeah, I contend that's what is, or should be, excuse me. The main thing is making disciples, which to do that, you spread the word. What is the main thing? You know, we want to say the, what, the word. We want to say God. Uh, and realize, as with salvation here, God and Jesus is truly the main thing. But how do we know about them? It's through the word. Uh, so we want to say the word is the main thing, but is it? And it's probably hard for us to tell because, you know, we've been involved. We're so close to things. But We apply the word to taking care of widows. Exactly. That's what we should be doing. Uh, but even then, realize what they are they're saying, that the apostles, the leaders are like, 
That's not going to be our focus. What would someone say? If you could draw back for a moment, it's hard for us to do. So imagine this, and one thing, I did it a couple times with people. I had uh, people who were not associated with the church, not just our church. I'm talking about unchurched people. Uh, it's easy, it was hard to find years ago, but it's easy to find them now. I had them come into the church and say, what do you see? What's your impression of the church? And specifically, imagine if you found someone who didn't grow up in the church, wasn't familiar with the church, and you had them visit, and not just this one, you know, okay, what do they think about us? But churches across the U.S., what would they say the main thing is in churches today? Do you? Entertainment. Entertainment might well be one. They're boring. <laughs> They're boring, okay, might well be one. Numbers. The main thing, that's not, boring isn't a main thing. That might be what they find out, but what would they say... Based on what we see, this is what is the main thing for churches today. Comfort. Comfort. Who's the biggest? Who's the biggest? So numbers. Friendly. Friendly. Okay. Yes. What's that? Judgmental. Judgmental. Okay. Help so. Needy. Help the needy. That you know, and that might well be. I think there's a lot of churches where that might be their main thing is to help the physical needs of people around them. Are, those, are any of those meant to be the main thing? No. So you look at these. And where would the word of God be, you think? Probably pretty low down on most churches. Now, again, you go to others, and there's a, a wide continuum here. But, and that's why one of the reasons I did mention the United States. Uh, there's a need for all those things that were good. You know, helping the needy and, you know, I mean, comfort in a sense. You know, it's not like we're going we're gonna to get the most uncomfortable benches we can and make you sit on them for... You know, like the old ascetics did. How much can we beat ourselves for God? But none of these are the main thing. Now, one thing I would ask, as I was thinking about this, uh, if a church has tons of Bible studies, and there are some churches that have tons of Bibles, like, you know, Sunday school, Sunday, Sunday night, midweek, other things, but nothing else, no fellowship, real focus, no prayer focus, are they really giving priority to the Word? It's what Claire said. you got to apply it. If all you do is study it, then you're not really getting priority to the Word. You just like studying the Bible. And like, okay, add another Bible study. I can't wait to learn more. I want more facts in my head. Well, being a Christian is not just facts in your head. It's living it out. So it's not just, you know, all right, that church has a lot of Bible studies. They are giving priority to the Word. Are they? I mean, there needs to be enough that people know the Word. But then there needs to be that other side that we're living it out. So again, what does this look like? Acts 5.42 It said, Every day in the temple and from house to house, they, the apostles, and certainly others, did not cease teaching and preaching. The NIV says proclaiming that Christ, the Christ is Jesus. Uh, I would say it looks like this. A church is focused on teaching and preaching, and, and I distinguish those. Teaching is what happens to believers. Preaching or proclaiming is what happens to non-believers. And that's why I say it's okay to talk back and forth here versus Sunday school. We sort of distinguish teaching as Sunday school and preaching as, you know, the worship service. In the New Testament, teaching is what happened to believers. Preaching or proclaiming is what happened to unbelievers, people who hadn't heard it before, hadn't made the decision. With the goal, so the church is focused on teaching and proclaiming the word when they have the goal of converting non-believers and transforming believers. In other words, making disciples. Because if you make a disciple, what's a disciple supposed to do? Make a disciple. And then that person, they make a disciple. So it's this continuing process. We're focused on the word if that's our goal. It's not just to learn facts. But it is to convert people who aren't believers into believers and transform believers into more fully mature Christ-like individuals who continue that progression. So that's what it looks like for a church as a whole would be my idea. How do we follow this precedent? The apostles said it. We have to give priority to the Word. And that's what it is. We, a church needs to have a focus that the Word is being taught, but definitely being taught with an, an eye to people transforming and changing, not just learning facts for Bible trivia. All right, what about church leaders then? How does it apply specifically? Verse 2 again, the 12 summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the Word of God, to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. In other words, they're saying this needs to be done. 
It is very important. Matter of fact, it's so important. Notice what they didn't do. All right, raise your hands if you can help oversee the widows. Raise your hand. Come on, we need someone. Now, there's some things I'm sure we're fine. Like, hey, this needs done. Raise your hand. This one, they're saying, no, this one, we want people who are, look at this, good repute, full of the Spirit, and of wisdom. That's really a pretty high bar. You know, we look at this and we say, you know, at least it gives precedent for deacons. You know, they aren't called deacons there, but they are going to serve in that sense. And that's what the word means, a minister. Um, these people, and they're going to go on. Stephen's going to be the first martyr. I hate to spoil, I should say spoiler alert, in case you didn't know that one. Philip is going to have a very prominent role. These were esteemed men. And so they didn't just say, hey, this little thing needs taken care of. Raise your hand. They're like, we need the best on this. And then they laid their hands on them. Uh, and we'll see later, that's what enabled these men to work miracles themselves. But they say, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to ministry of the Word. We want the best on this. Here's what we're going to keep doing. Well, what's that look like today? And here's what I would say. Um, the leaders need to be doing it, the elders need to be ensuring it, and the members need to be supporting it. This priority on the Word. And the question that came up for me is, who are these leaders today? We talk about leaders. We realize this passage here, these were the apostles. These were the, what the Bible calls the foundation of the church. Jesus is the cornerstone. These were the foundation. In that sense, there are no apostles left today. There are people who have an apostolic type bent, you know, to go into new areas is how that's usually couched. You know, and be like that. But there are no apostles today. These were unique individuals. Uh, this was before there were elders. There had been no indication they'd appointed elders. People who would, would be called evangelists to go out and do that. These were apostles. Well, what is, who are these leaders today? I think you'd definitely say the preacher of a church would fall into this category. Uh, some elders, the Bible talks about, you know, certain elders are worthy of double honor. The ones who not only guide the church, but who also teach. That's the double honor, you know, double honor. And they're also, those people would be worthy of being paid because that takes even more time. So the Bible talks about that. And I would think those who have the gift of teaching. You know, the Bible talks about some have the gift of teaching. So those would be the leaders, as I think the application would work at today. And realize uh, this ministry of the word doesn't mean just proclaiming it, to be able to proclaim this, what do you have to do first? To be able to proclaim it effectively, let's say that. <laughs> Anyone can get up and talk. What do you have to do first? You ever got ready for a Sunday school class? Or... Yeah, you got to study. Yeah. So that counts as ministry of the Word. That it's not just the time you spend actually talking, it's everything you do before that that makes your talking <laughs> hopefully worth listening to. So ministry of the Word. So, leaders are, need to be doing, the elders ensuring, and the members supporting. Okay, I go back to what's that look like, and I'm going to start with that last one. The members need to support this paradigm, this view of things. Let me ask you a question. Who should make it a priority to visit members, uh, especially if they're in the hospital, maybe shut in? Who should, who should make sure that they, they go see those people in a church setting? Oh, you know the answer. Uh, anyone. Anyone? Anyone. Oh, come on. You know what an answer would be from a lot of people. The minister. The minister. Yeah, the preacher has to go see him. That's his job. Everybody knows that. You know? Look it up. It's in the King James for sure. The followers, like she said. Yes, but you know that's not what, boy, it's not what I've heard at times. Boy, if the minister, the preacher doesn't come show up, dereliction of duty. If he doesn't show up, show me the Bible passage for that. You know, the only thing that comes close, and that would be the elders, this is James that talks about the elders going to visit someone who's sick and anointing them with oil and praying over them. And I hate to be a, to you know break the bad news, but if you look at the context of James, the main focus of the prayer isn't that the person gets well, it's that they deal with it with joy. Doesn't mean you can't pray the person gets well. But the whole book about, the whole focus of James is consider your joy when you face trials. And then you think that the elders are supposed to go, Lord, please help this person escape their trial. No, help them face this with joy. So that's the only thing that comes close. Um, who should strive to be at all church activities? I mean, if, if the doors of the church are open, this person needs to be there. 
What if it's a women's meeting? I'd still be here. <laughs> well, yeah. here you run out. <laughs> you know, I used to, to tell the church in Scottsdale as we were growing, so I can't wait till we get so busy. No one can be at all the church activities because we got two going on at the same time. What would you do there? Uh-oh. No one needs to be at all the church events. And you know who especially doesn't need to be at all the church events? The preacher. The one that preaches before I got there in Scottsdale. He made sure, like, nothing happened that he didn't oversee. Man, that'd be hell on earth. For me. And it shouldn't have been him, because then what happens? How big can you get? How much ministry can you have? Now, I'm saying numbers big. How much ministry can you have? As much as one person can have his hand directly in. What if you need more ministry? Wasn't that a reason why a lot of churches, I'm not saying mega churches, but a lot of the bigger churches end up having, uh, kind of, they kind of call them a hospitality slash concierge person, which kind of helps oversee kind of the thing, activities and the stuff. That they definitely have. add more staff. That's the only thing like, is. That's kind of like bar for us here. So yeah. Isn't it better? I mean, I don't know, you know, but isn't it better to find someone who has that gift in the church versus hire someone and use resources that way? No. It's a cop out. For to hire, to have someone in the church? No, no, I mean just for us to just delegate one person because it leaves us it leaves Oh yeah. Us everyone needs to be using their gifts. That'd be another sermon. Yeah. We're going to talk about. Yeah, everyone needs to be using their gifts. But a lot of these things and there's what it comes up to for me. I'm not saying that these things should are not important. Again, you remember this issue in the passage. You couldn't get more important than food and unity. The most important physical need, one of the three, and probably the most, and the most important spiritual need, unity. This was important. But other people can and should be doing it versus the preacher. Versus, I would say, even some of the, the people who are gifted at teaching. You know, if they only have so much time, and it's either do I prepare for a lesson or do I engage in this other activity, we sort of need you to prepare for a lesson because that's your gift. Let someone else who's better at things. You know, some of the things, and again, I heard people say my preaching's at least passable. I'm glad. Thank you. You know what I'm not good at? Small talk with people. Oh, my. It's just not. That's not my gift. If I came to visit you in a hospital, it'd be awkward silence. There's some other people, though. They come visit you. You... When they left you, you know, when I left, you'd be relieved too. But when they left, you'd feel better. Like, you'd really be uplifted. God has gifted people in different ways. If your gift is to teach, that needs to be the priority. If your calling is to teach, preach, that needs to be, the, that's what this passage is saying. It is not saying some things are more important in the, in, you know, to, that they, they shouldn't be done. It's saying, Certain people should do these things. Other people should do these things. And that's how the church then continued to grow. If a member has the gift of teaching and is teaching, again, then that needs to be their priority. And they might not be able to get to everything else because we all have lives too. Uh, it's not saying that that's above any everything else, only that it takes time and you only have so much time. Does that make sense? All right, so the members need to be supporting that. And it sounds like your answers are honest here. You, you support that. That's not true everywhere. Again, I have gotten, you know, chided for not showing up. Here. You didn't come visit me in the hospital. Did other people come visit you? Yes, they did, but you didn't. Okay. That, that's just a, a lack of awareness of biblical principles. And that's where the last one, elders need to be ensuring this. You know, hopefully members do support, but elders must ensure. Must make it clear. You know, you guys are, are looking for a new preacher, new minister. Uh, the elders need to make it clear to people. Uh, you know, I helped set up the uh, the ad for what is being looked for. Visitation at time allows. There's other things that that person can do that no one else can. That's what they need to be doing and focused on. The elders need to be ensuring that. If there's any pushback, the elders need to be saying, no, this is what the Bible says. When you're clear what the Bible says, this is how it works out in today's world. We support this. Yeah. It says, um, and I think it's verse 5 of chapter 6, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed laid their hands on them, or no, before that, uh, the seven and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism, is Judaism Christian or Muslim? 
No, so Judaism is neither one. So a proselyte means that, so everyone else had been born in a Jewish home and always Jewish. A proselyte means they were born in a home that wasn't Jewish, so they were not Jewish culture. Uh, but then they became a Jew. They were witnessed to by Jews, and that did happen. It wasn't a big focus in the Old Testament, but people did at times look at them and say, well, this whole one God thing makes sense. I want to be like that. And so that's who he was. He was not born a Jew, but he became a Jew in terms of faith. He, he adopted the Jewish faith. He still would be whatever nationality he was. And so that'd be, again, another person that would be great to minister to these Hellenistic widows because he understood that culture. Antioch, is that like Turkey? It's somewhere over there. Don't, don't get my biblical geography going. But there's two Antiochs, and it, and it doesn't even tell us, I think, which one he's from. But there were two main Antiochs. He was from one of them. They were both outside of Judea. So that's the big thing. He wasn't born in the area. He wasn't born in a, in a Jewish place. But he became a Christian. But he became a Jew of uh, faith, and then later he became a Christian. So all those people were Christians, or they wouldn't have been considered. Good question. All right, one other thing to point out here. We've been talking about the ministry of the word, but notice in verse 2 it does say, The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. But then when they summarize things at the end, they say, After these men have been selected, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So that's a priority as well, they're saying. Right up there with the ministry, the word is also praying. Uh, the apostles were spending their time praying. How much time do you think they spent praying each day? A lot. A lot. Yeah, we don't have any answer. I'll bet it's a lot. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, I'm guessing, you know, if it was 15 minutes a day, they probably had plenty of time to wait tables. I think they spent a lot of time in prayer. I, you could say that that was a key part of their ministry or their job, if you want to call it that. This is what they did full time at this point. You know, later on, as they spread out, there will be questions. You know, at all like I, I worked to support myself. You know, at times so I could preach, but the other apostles were supported. This was their job. Well, today, you know, again, especially as you think about hiring a, a new preacher, how much time would you expect that a preacher spends praying? And the other side of that, how much time would you allow? And right now, again, I've been working with the elders to craft a, a ministry uh, statement, a, a, an ad, you know, and they're looking at like 20 hours a week. Okay? What if you told me I'm going to pray five of that? Would that be okay? Or would that be, no, we need you to do other things. See, that's something to think about. Yeah. They say we gave priority to prayer. Remember being at a minister's meeting once and someone who was, and I don't know, as a matter of fact, I think he was a native in whatever Muslim country he lived. He said, I have to pray two hours a day or I literally would not survive physically. He said, there are people trying to kill me. Satan is behind all of that. He truly believed if he didn't pray two hours a day, Satan and the, the Muslims who were against him would find a way to kill him. Yeah, if preachers today died, if they didn't pray two hours a day, there'd be a lot of empty pulpits. This one included. Yeah. So as you think about it, expectations of, here's how much we want you to pray. Here's how much, you know, should pray. Is being prayerfully minded the same as praying throughout the day? I'd say no. The Bible says pray without ceasing, and that's prayerfully minded. Absolutely. But it also shows people who spent time in prayer. You know, Daniel was prayerfully minded, I'm guessing, but he got down on his knees the three times. Even when he knew it could cost him his life. You know, you, you know we're talking, talking about how much we pray and stuff like that. And sometimes, it kind of brought a thought to my mind is, you know, one of the biggest kind of rules that my parents had in our more keeping my brother and I's our eyes off of bad things, of bad TV shows and bad movies and things like that. As we grow up, we kind of just did whatever in that way. We've gotten better at it, obviously, but one of the things that I thought of is, you know, with technology these days, um, social 
be is too much, but I also need when I don't have to. Yeah, different jobs. I mean, if you're a social media manager, you're spending 40 hours a week. That's your job. Or more. But the rest of us, yeah. Yeah, there's a quote, and I can't, I won't get it right, but it's like the one benefit of social media is to prove uh, the old excuse is wrong that I don't have time for Bible study and prayer. Yeah. Like, we got time for what we make time for, mm -hmm. don't we? Yeah. Well, again, so a preacher, uh, that should be part of their, in fact, let's add that to the job description. I, I didn't put it in there. It needs to be on that job description, prayer. And elders, it needs to be part of, that you view as your ministry. What do you view as the ministry of an elder? This, this, this. So it needs to be prayer. You know, it is that important. We see it in the, we've seen it from the beginning of Acts here. Well, what about the personal level? Again, this passage is about the church. The church as a whole, the leaders ensure it, uh, but I think we make application to our personal level. For us in our lives, what does it mean for us, you know, uh, the opposite of neglect prayer, what's it mean for us to give priority to prayer? You know, think about it. Uh, God has different ways to communicate with us. His word is the main way, of course, but Psalms tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. You know, we get a little bit from that. We only have one way to communicate with God. So him to us, he's got more than one. For us to communicate with God, there's only one way. And it's prayer. So what does it mean to give priority to prayer as a believer? And I realize, we look at, oh, I don't have time, this and that. One thing I've started doing is uh, when, when I drive in my car, I, I, I love music. Anyone knows me, like I love music. Uh, but I've been turning off the radio because uh, I don't look commercials anyway, so it's not as much of a sacrifice. If I had serious, it'd be a bigger sacrifice, but commercial-free radio. And I've been using that time to pray. Like, just, all right, God, here's, here's time, you and me, driving to Fort Wayne, driving to Auburn. You know, even that's 10, 15 minutes, one way. And finding time to pray. I think if you pray first, things kind of fall in order. That helps as well. You know, and set the time. Be, be thinking of some things. You know, another little, little trick. I remember my dad's or like uh, when I lived, when we lived in Scottsdale. Literally, the longest part of my commute from our house to the church was the one stoplight. Uh, we were literally a mile away. You know, and the longest part of that little mile travel was waiting at the stoplight. Uh, you know, I don't like to wait. My dad says, you know, when you're waiting at the stoplight, pray for the church. And so, I, you know, the stoplight I take there, I pray for church. And well, if I go another direction, there's a stoplight there. I'll use this one to pray for my family. And just find ways to do that. You know, when I find, when we have time, or time, when we have space to put in a, uh, now an exercise machine, so far out of my mind. Prayer. What's the thing you walk on? Treadmill. Uh, see how long it's been since I did that. One of the things I love to do when I had a, a located ministry is I walk around the worship center and pray. And partly because I don't know if this affects you, but if I just sit in my chair and pray, I'm very inclined to fall asleep. Yeah, I gotta be up doing something. So I walk all around the worship center and pray. Well, don't have that now. As soon as I can get a treadmill, that, that's gonna be it. I'm gonna walk on that and pray. I've never fallen asleep on a treadmill before. I've never fallen asleep walking around the church before. Whatever it takes for you, find time to pray because as believers, it needs to be a priority for us as well. All right, what about? Uh, reading the word. As believers, we shouldn't neglect that either. Um, and not just read. One thing that happens, and it goes back to like the Bible studies. Make sure when you are engaged in the word, it's what I try to bring out at times, sometimes I forget in some sermons, uh, what's the subject and what's the lesson? Now, you need to not only observe, as you read a passage, uh, there's three levels. Observe is what happened or what was said. You know, Noah built an ark. God told Noah to build an ark. Noah built an ark. They got on there and say, that's what happened. All right, what's the subject? What's the lesson? Reflect on it. And then how does that apply to me? Observation, reflection, application. Make sure you're doing those next two steps. You know, not only, oh, I read the Bible today. I got through my, I got through three chapters today. <clears throat> okay. What did you get from the three chapters? <laughs> you know, and not just Bible history. What did you get from that? What's a, a lesson God wants you to learn from that passage? And what are you going to do about it? If you're just zipping through the Bible to say, I read, you know, it's one of my things about reading through the Bible in a year. Uh, great to do once in a while, but if that's all you do, again, it's pretty much on the observation level. 
I know the facts of the Bible very well, but have they gotten into me? One thing that's helped me is read the, the notes. If you have notes in the Bible that have the footnotes at the bottom. And then they, a lot of times will have a reference to another scripture. Some other passages. So yeah. There's room for that. And then they have footnotes for that. And you just keep going and going. Yeah, that is, you know, something that can help a little addition. Now, realize those notes are not uh, inspired. Uh, I was in a Sunday school class once, my first year in Bible college. I went back to the class, and I, she, the teacher said something and was quoting from the whoever wrote the lesson material. And I said, yeah, I don't think so. And she said, no, it says it right here in the notes in my Bible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Paul didn't write that. <laughs> Peter didn't write that. Someone else. So as long as you realize any of those things, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, we need to, to get deeper. So it's not just how much time do I spend reading the Bible or listening to the Bible nowadays, whatever it is. It's like, do I dig down? Uh, quite honestly, you know, Max Lucado has an approach to reading the Bible. He says, I, I read until I find something that strikes me, and I stop and I focus on that. So sometimes I get through a chapter, sometimes I get through a verse. Okay. Be way more effective in your life if you read one verse and found something and dwelled on it and reflected on it and applied it than if you read 10 chapters and you just know what happened in 10 chapters. So find time. As, as individual Christians, we as well. 2 Corinthians 3.18 is my verse of verses. It says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It says that we are changed as we behold the glory of Jesus. And that the old word for glory is simply a word that means a person's character, who they were and what they did. So as we behold Jesus' character, who he was and what he did, we become more like him. It's the law of association. You become like what you look at longingly, lovingly, and continually. All right? How's a person become greedy? They look at money longingly, lovingly, and continually. How does a married person fall into an affair? They look at the wrong person longingly, lovingly, continually. Well, it can work in a good way, too. I look at Jesus longingly, lovingly, and continually, and I become more like him. That's what this passage is saying. Well, where do I see Jesus? In the Word. I read the Word, and I meditate on, you know, what's it telling me? And even if it's not a passage from the Gospels, it still has something in there that is Jesus' teaching before he left. What did he say to the apostles? I have many more things that I need to tell you. I don't have time. What are those many more things? Well, they're the rest of the Bible, from Acts to Revelation. The reason we need to study the Word constantly is so that we can give an answer to people who ask us. That's definitely one of the reasons, yeah. Yep, that is one of the reasons, and that's where you do need to know some, what does the Bible say on that level, more in the observation level. Yeah, you need to know. What's it say about the plan of salvation? What's it say about Jesus coming back? What's it say about grace? Absolutely. But then as a person to grow and transform, I need to dig into that and like, all right, what's the lesson here? How does this, where's, how does this affect my relationship with God? And that's really the key thing is you're digging down deep in the Bible. Everything in the Bible, because everything in history is about our relationship with God. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he kept going and he created mankind. mankind. Why? To have a relationship. We weren't just decoration. We wanted to have a relationship with us. And when we broke that relationship with sin, it started with Adam and Eve, what's the first thing God did? I'm going to fix this. I'm going to make it possible for us to have a relationship again. What's the entire New Testament about? It's about that relationship. You restore it when you become a Christian, and then you continually build it and grow it and develop it as a Christian. Yeah. So that's what you want to look at. When you're looking at the Bible, I don't know how to study the Bible. Well, you read it with that in mind. What does this verse have to say about my relationship with God, this passage, my relationship with God? How should it affect that? As believers, again, we shouldn't neg go neglect the Word of God or prayer either. But, again, especially when it comes to the Word of God, it doesn't mean, well, I just read it through real. You know, God got five chapters under my belt today. Find out what that passage is saying to you, even if it's one verse. Well, when this happened in the early church, again, think about it. We're looking at what they did. The apostles, it's theoretically, oh, I hate that word, theoretically possible. Next time you're going to say that for me, Sam, okay? Theoretically. Oh, theoretically. 
I did see you do it better than I did. Oh, maybe not that good. The apostles could have said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's cut back on this whole ministry of the word and prayer thing and make sure these widows get taken care of directly. They didn't do that. And because of that, it says in Acts 6, verse 7, the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. These level of results, it's been saying, you know, so many people became Christians, so many people, you know, were at it. But this, this one's different. And it happens right after this key moment where they're faced with a temptation by Satan himself and the leaders say, no, we're going to keep giving priority to the word and you see what happens. We're going to make sure this need gets met by very capable spiritual men. The word and what it is, what it tells us about God and Jesus, that's the most important thing. Wouldn't you like to see those kind of results, you know, as a church and as individuals in my life? Wouldn't I like to see God work in that way? This doesn't have to be an either or. Absolutely. They saw the wisdom of both needs. Yeah. Both of them are needs. It's just, they said, you know, that, and that's why I added the leaders. But I've done this sermon before years ago, and it didn't have that focus on the leaders. There are people who that's their need, their focus, is to do that. Or there are those who, if that's their gift and that's their calling, they need to give priority to the word, specifically their ministry, and make sure other people are giving priority to the other things. Because they are needs. Yeah. That's where delegation of uh, responsibility comes handy. For each one of us have our own title. Exactly. You should be anxious. And we, this passage isn't all about that. And there will be other passages that talk about it more. You should be looking. What's my gift? What does, has God gifted me to do that can make an eternal impact? That should be the question we, we all are asking. One of the things I've run into with others that they keep saying... I don't have any talent, but I talked to one lady, and she she is very much into prayer, and she likes to be close to people. And I said, that is your talent. It's a great gift. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone has something. Again, this sermon not specifically on that, but others will be, and there's things you can do to, to find your gift, what it is.